Please uh, help me welcome Rick Bruner, Vice President of Research Analytics of Viant. Rick? Thank you very much, Peter. Do I have a clicker yes, up there? Well, uh, I think I gave you a concise summary of the topic because I just saw my whole presentation fly by in those two sentences of introduction. <laughs> uh, so yes, thank you. Um, I'm here representing Viant uh, in the course of explaining how we are doing what I am going to talk about. I'll explain a little bit more about the company. Uh, but as Peter said, we really feel that we are, we have, uh, I was told not to use the word pioneer, but we, we have uh, demonstrated a methodology that I expect is gonna become widely practiced throughout the market research industry, uh, rivaling the position of market mix modeling across multiple different platforms. And so, without further ado, let me get right into it. That's <clears throat> the title of my presentation. So in the beginning, there was television, and it was great. And for decades, we measured it through marketing mix modeling, a highly probabilistic approach to understanding how many media dollars went in at the top of the funnel and how many sales dollars came out at the bottom of the funnel, and a lot of connected assumptions in between to try to demonstrate what the causal effect there is. Uh, and it served us well for decades. And then along came the internet, a whole new type of media platform based on networked computers, which gave rise to different ways we could measure. And a primary measurement methodology, particularly for trying to understand the downstream effect to sales that the advertising is having, uh, is attribution modeling. Uh, I imagine many of you are, are broadly familiar with these. Attribution modeling uh, had some distinct advantages, arguably, over marketing mix modeling. It's based on very large scale, if not census level, imperial observation of the media exposures. Uh, so it's, it's got you know, big data behind it. And in the case, as is frequently the case of attribution modeling, <laughs> measuring through to sales online, uh, e-commerce sales, you can have a virtually complete set of the media exposure data and the sales activity data. It also, though, has some limitations worth noting. It is based on cookies in large part, which we all should understand at this point have uh, you know, a number of shortcomings to them. They're uh, regular churn, uh, impersistence, and non-functionality on certain digital devices, notably a lot of mobile devices. Uh, also, it's really limited to the digital medium. And as I mentioned, it really focuses where it focuses on, e -com uh, on uh, sales, largely in an e-commerce model. Uh, of course, only about 7% of all retail sales in the United States take place in e-commerce. That volume is rapidly growing and that share is growing, but it's still distinctly the minority of all sales. So it's, it, you're not accounting for any of the effect of digital advertising on offline. And this represents really a giant gap in the world of market research in that these two channels, television and digital media, represent the majority of all advertising spending. And there isn't one sound, consistent, empirical, observational method that applies equally to both of them. Until now, I would argue. Oh, that was supposed to be an exciting reveal. <laughs> um, so as Peter described, we have coined this new approach uh, that you know, we are not uniquely capable of delivering. Uh, it is a methodology that I'll explain exactly how we do it. Uh, we call it people-based mixed measurement. And it brings into analysis both television uh, and digital on the same platform. And we've, uh, as I'm going to explain, also been able to expand it to offline sales. So we're looking at both television and digital ad exposure, and uh, I should acknowledge that we, Viant, my company, was bought earlier this year by Time Inc., the magazine company, and if we fast forward to my presentation next year, we will certainly have uh, examples where print is folded into this, uh, into this mechanism as well. 
So I'm going to tell the story of, of what we did and how we did through a case study. <clears throat> and this is uh, a large luxury retailer, I'm not at liberty to name them, but it's a brand that I expect most of you to be familiar with. Uh, very, uh, you know, they, they have their own owned and operated stores across the country, 750 stores, plus a lot of e-commerce activity as well. And Viant, we are essentially a digital media and ad technology company. We uh, ran a massive amount of advertising in the digital channels, uh, both display, uh, desktop and mobile, video and display, though primarily display, uh, for their uh, 2015 holiday, just the, the recent holiday uh, season. They also, needless to say, had a very large budget of television advertising during that same period. Uh, it's a longtime client of ours, one who trusts us to, with their data, and uh, that trust relationship really helped uh, make this possible. Uh, and they're one who always is pushing the envelope for learning, so they were a great beta test for this capability. And the, the main objective that they were looking to us for was to demonstrate the respective return on ad spend, that acronym ROAS, instead of ROI, we prefer to say return on ad spend, uh, across television and digital in a, a balanced uh, methodology that, that accounts for both. So let me explain a little bit about who Viant is and how we have the capabilities to do this. Uh, so Viant is a new name, a little over a year and a half old, for a company that's been around for 17 years. We have a, a family of companies now. Viant is the parent, but you may <clears throat> be familiar with specific media if you've been around the <clears throat> internet advertising business for a while. That's one of our older brands. Um, but we repositioned ourselves in the last couple of years, uh, well, a year and a half ago as this company, Viant, uh, as a people-based advertising platform. And that's a term that's become very vogue and familiar in the digital ad space, but I know all of you don't live and breathe that as much as I do. What that means is a move away from cookies and back towards personally identifiable information. So knowing Joel, Joel Rubinson and Peter Orban and Rick Bruner uh, as individual records in this database. So we had made an acquisition of MySpace uh, in 2011. MySpace, uh, we've relaunched it. It's an entertainment destination site. Of course, it's not nearly as big as it once was, but once upon a time, it was the biggest site on the internet with the biggest registration database on the internet. Uh, as I mentioned, we've also been acquired by Time Inc. Uh, whose publications include, of course, Time Magazine, uh, People Magazine, Sports Illustrated, uh, many, you know, the, it's the largest magazine country, uh, company in the world. Uh, they also have a lot of person-level data, all their subscribers and registrants to their websites. Though all that uh, profile data is housed uh, in the leftmost uh, component of what we call our advertising cloud, uh, our identity management platform. So think of it as a DMP, but with identity. So we actually, every profile is dense with information. The, the email address is a primary key, but we have people's first, last names, physical address, gender, age, uh, as well as their whole uh, device graph. We know uh, we link to that single record of the person, their desktop identifiers, their mobile device IDs, their primary IP address, and their what we filter as a household IP address, discriminating uh, you know, other types of IP addresses from households. So that's the identity man management platform. The media execution, we've been around for 17 years in the digital ad space. We have uh, ad technology, and uh, you know, we're, we're certainly programmatic, but we've also been a an ad network so we can deliver advertising at scale. That is our specialty. And then the data analytics, which uh, is really the <clears throat> highlight of what I'll showcase here. Uh, and two components also that I need to, to mention as part of the uh, data analytics platform uh, are so we have this identity map of all the people. We've also created a network of automatic content recognition in televisions, uh, abbreviated ACR. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but it's 
basically a, uh, it recognizes the unique signature of audiophiles. And so it, in the case of televisions, it, it can be applied to different devices. So I was just speaking with a gentleman who's uh, built, used the technology uh, in, in mobile devices and so forth. But in the context of a television set, all smart televisions being produced today, which is basically all modern televisions, uh, almost certainly have this technology built into them. So when people t you know, take their large flat screens home and hook them up to their Wi-Fi and go through some privacy uh, opportunities where they could opt out, but if they don't, and most don't, uh, it'll feed back through the network everything that is playing on the screen. Compared, for example, to set-top box, uh, capture of television. There are a couple of potential advantages to ACR. One is that unlike set-top box, which recognizes only what plays through the cable provider, the box, uh, this recognizes anything on the television. So whether it's through the cable, whether it's through digital antenna, uh, through over-the-top content, something on YouTube they're watching on their television, uh, DVR, uh, game consoles, so on and so forth. We see anything that plays through the television device and any advertising that plays through the television device, we can recognize. So working with the client, we fingerprint the ad, which means we just take an MP4 video file, run it through the system, and, and you know, create that original audio fingerprint, and then anywhere that, uh, across these televisions, which are also very geographically diverse, uh, uh, diverse, unlike some set-top box uh, data providers where they've partnered with specific cable companies that have a ge geographic bias. Uh, this is l less subject to that kind of bias. There may be other biases that you want, you'd want to discuss, but those are some of the advantages of the ACR approach. And then we layer all that digital ad data that we've delivered with the large sample, so we have uh, uh, this network of seven million homes that we have the ACR uh, data that we can capture from. So it's not all televisions in the United States, obviously, but a very large sample. And then we can, based on the IP address and other identifiers in that data, we can bring together and see who is exposed on what type of platform. Uh, and as I finish out my case study here, uh, we also had all the sales data. So our solution, as I've said, we have that identity management platform, the IMP. Uh, in this case, this advertiser gave us, for targeting purposes as at the beginning of the campaign, uh, CRM data of their existing customers. So we were able to target ads to their existing customers, as well as do lookalike modeling to broaden that to a large scale. We got the ACR data, it says 10 million homes there. Uh, it's a little bit of a fluid number. I, I would say seven million, in fact. Uh, and then we got 100% of the sales data. So the, the client fed us in real time back throughout the whole uh, Q4 holiday season, all sales data with person level identification of uh, you know, the buyers. So you know, obviously not cash buyers, but credit card buyers where they'd have that information. So we could match those people to our identity management platform. Uh, and then in this empirical model, we could report comparative return on ad spend for those channels in an attribution model type approach. So at a high level summary, and I'll, I'll flip through another couple of slides to go into a little bit more detail, but comparing the conversion rates of the television exposed households to the digitally exposed households, we saw the television exposed households go on to make purchases at twice the rate of the digital exposed, you know, display advertising primarily, exposed households. So why is the digital guy up here on stage telling you that TV outperformed digital? Uh, remember, this was a return on ad spend model uh, measurement, and the cost, the media cost of the television was considerably higher than the media cost of what was primarily display advertising. So under $2 CPMs for the display, approximately $15 CPMs for the, uh, the television, resulting in about a 7x uh, return on ad spend uh, margin in favor of the digital exposure, the digitally exposed audience. Uh, needless to say, the audience that was exposed to both television and digital converted at a higher rate, or maybe not needless to say, but we were able to observe that. Uh, however, their, the cost of that media was weighted 
more in favor of the television, cost of media, and so on a return on ad spend basis. It, it performs slightly better than the display uh, only, but only marginally. So my clock is counting down, but these last few slides just show you some of the other kind of depth that with this approach that we can go into. So we could compare, uh, for the, this is, uh, for those of you who are immersed like me in digital a advertising, uh, a metric that we look at in video advertising is the video completion rate. What proportion of everybody exposed watched the video all the way through to the end. Uh, and you can see these rates here on the right-hand column, the 75 to 100% are all under 50%. So we were able, well, first of all, just, you know, what's important here is that we were able to determine this. We were able to, because the ACR can see within a matter of seconds, it can recognize the content, we can see people who switch channels after a few seconds. So we could report on what proportion of the ads by creative unit, in this case, uh, were played all the way through. Similarly, this is more you know, completion rate analysis by network and by uh, actual program that it ran in. And then maybe more interesting, uh, the conversion rates. So this is looking just at e-commerce conversions uh, because obviously of data sample sizes, uh, we, we highlight this here. Um, so, you know, impression volume we're seeing in the second column, how many of the impressions went to the various channels, and what the website visitation rate was from each of those channels, and what then the actual purchase conversion rate was. Uh, and similarly, again, by the show that it ran in. Uh, and then here is even uh, conversion rates by day part. So a depth of analysis of effect of your TV advertising on sales that, to my mind, I haven't seen, but I mean, to my, uh, you know, in my own experience, I've not seen before. I, I would boldly claim that uh, we are, you know, the first to market to do this type of analysis. Um, right, so, you know, <laughs> make sure you measure what's important because measuring makes all the difference. And I'm, I believe I'm, am I yes. over time? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, so we have, we have uh, time for one question. Right over there. See the right first hand up over here? Yeah. We'll wait for the mic for a moment. This is fabulous. Hi, thank you. Excellent presentation. Um, my question is how um, often is the, your identity management um, bucket uh, refreshed? Is it continually being refreshed or um, periodically? Yeah, it's, it's not a bucket for starters. It's a <laughs> we call it the IMP, the uh, Identity Management Platform. It is, well, we are continuously adding data of all sorts of different types in there. We're doing a lot of uh, validation and uh, appending of data from other sources, first and foremost from Experian, and we have a monthly uh, sync with Experian. But you know, data is being written into it uh, from various other sources with even greater frequency. But I, I'd say that you know, at least monthly. Great. Thank you, and help me thank you, Rick, for his excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.